Well, we have several passages that Mike has asked us to look at this morning. Remember, we are going through a series on the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. We're going to begin with uh, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. So turn there, and we're going to begin with verse 19. That's 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to read verses 19 through 30. So it came about at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Meholothite, for a wife. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they told Saul, the thing was agreeable to him. And Saul thought, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David, for a second time, you may be my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, speak to David secretly, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become this king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke these words to David. But David said, Is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and slightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul reported to him according to those words which David spoke. Saul then said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. Before the days had expired, David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down two hundred men among the Philistines. Then David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. So Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, for a wife. When Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him, then this Saul was even more years. afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so his name was highly esteemed. Now flip over to Psalm 109, and we're going to look at verses 17 through 19. That's Psalm 109, beginning with verse 17. Just two verses, 17 through 19. He also loved cursing, so it came to him, and he did not delight in blessing, so it was far from him. But he clothed himself with cursing as with his garment, and it entered into his body like water and like oil to his bones. Let it be to him as a garment with which he covers himself and for a belt with which he constantly girds himself. Now, lastly, we're going to look over at uh, Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 21. Romans 1, 18 through 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Mike. Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. How many of you read the Bible to your grandchildren or to your children? Put them up in your lap and read the scriptures. Come on. Here at Believer's Chapel, don't we have some that do that? There you go. Well, I have brought an action Bible, and anyone that wants one will provide that right here in this class. Uh, it is loaded with pictures, and it's in a comic book style, but it gives children the stories of the scriptures and anything that we can do to get the stories of the word of god into the minds of young people uh, 
I think is important. Children are very visual, so we have lots of pictures in a comic book type style so that they will see and remember. So uh, nobody has volunteered to raise their hand. Uh, okay, there we go. I'll bring, uh, next time, I'll bring five and we'll see uh, how we go from, from there. Our text looks very innocuous, doesn't it? From 19 to 30, 1 Samuel 18. But in reality, it is got very great significance to us all. We have two very important theological points that come right out of this text. And inserted in it is a window of something that our writer wants us to see and know and remember, both for those he is writing to, which is Israel itself, but to us as well with a practical application to that. So with further no further ado, I will launch right into our exposition this morning, beginning in verse 19. At the time, now we immediately stop and we see the word time. We mark that. Why? That's a providence. We're studying the Bible here together. And I want to take you by the hand and try to give you a method, an application to study the Bible. So here is time. Time is a providence. It's like a stamp upon a period, a day. We think of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. In the fullness of time, Paul wrote, God sent His Son born of a woman, born under the law. There it is, time. So what we have is a stopping point in the story that should arrest our attention. Time. What is the time in reference to? Well, this daughter of Saul, the first daughter, had been pledged and promised to David because his accomplishments. First of all, he was, it was to be given to him because he killed Goliath, but that faded away in the wind. Then he was to get the oldest daughter because he was a brave warrior and he fought valiantly. And he did all that. But again, we come to verse 19, and that fades away from Saul the king as well. So look at these words. It's the time to give Merib, the first daughter, but instead she is given to Adriel. Now, Adriel is not a Jewish name. We're not really sure what Adriel ethnicity is. But look, repeated twice, which is important. Why? Because we have previously learned about the king. Uh, the king is not a giver. He's a taker. Uh, the right of the king, 1 Samuel 8, 11. He will take and take, and take, and take. The king is big government, big king. He's working for you all the time, seven days a week. Don't you just feel it? Yeah. No, the repetition of given jumps off the page at us here. 
teaching us that this man Saul, he has a methodology to his kingship. He works people. He works places. He works things to achieve his purpose. So it is, what do I need to do or say in order to get the response that I want or to meet my own ends? Now, after all, isn't that the tradecraft of a good politician? Yeah, that's Saul. When righteousness teaches us to disadvantage ourselves to advantage others, what is Saul doing here? He's disadvantaging others to advantage himself. Paul's, Saul's uh, previous offer of his daughter Merib to David was disingenuous to be sure. It was a pledge of convenience only to accomplish his own purpose. He wanted David on the battlefield and he wanted him against the Philistines. This husband, Adriel, scholars are not sure of the origin of his name, but mark this carefully. In this marriage, he's going to have five sons. And in 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 8, they are going to be executed by the Gibeonites. Think about that. They're Gibeonites, and the execution occur as a result, according to the Scriptures, of the sins of Saul. My friends, this is a bad guy to be attached to. Every one of the descendants of Saul are going to be cut off from the land of the living, meaning they have no future. They will have no place except one. One in the Word of God, 2 Samuel. His name is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, who can't really function normally, is a broken man. And yet, he is the one that David is going to extend kindness, hesed, covenant faithfulness to, and bring him to his table. Mephibosheth is a picture of us. We're broken, all of us, every one. We have no future in the land of the living. We're going to die. And yet, here is the substance. David was the shadow. He is going to bring us to his table. And we will be with him and enjoy his bounties and benefits for all eternity. But this is tragic. The death of your children. All because you were linked to Saul. Now we're early in the Bible study. Let's get a smile on our faces. We've got good news here. Why, look, Michael loves David. We're going to have a wedding. Daughter of Saul number two. The only woman, according to Robert Alter, a Jewish scholar, in the Hebrew Bible that it explicitly is reported to love a man. Now that's interesting because the Scriptures say nothing of David's feelings toward her. What is this relationship all about? Well, it will unfold over time in David's life. But it leaves us all questioning just exactly what is the basis of this marriage. I think we've all questioned that at some point regarding our former president, Bill Clinton, and his wife. Just exactly what that marriage 
is all about doesn't seem to make sense to us. But Saul was informed or reported or told his daughter Michael loves David. And the matter was right in his eyes. For the second time, Saul again will make ill use of his own child in attempt to destroy David. This word inform, told. Wouldn't we all like to know what the content of that was all about? In 189, Saul was, we we're told, kept an eye on David. Now, was that personal? Him himself keeping an eye? Or did he give an order to his officials to watch him and his movements closely? We really don't know. But here is what we do know. That this is the beginning of the special feature in our narrative. Think of it this way. It is like our text from verse 20 here to verse 26 is going to be in like in a three dimension. It's going to lift off the page toward our face as we're looking down at the text. Or it's going to be like a window on your computer that pops up and you're immediately drawn to the content of that window. Or it's like a museum piece. You go to the Mona Lisa and you don't go, wow, what a magnificent frame that is. No, you're looking at the content. We're looking at her and her eyes. That's the idea that we have here of this frame. And it's spelled out for us. You may have the word in your text, pleasant or pleasing, and then you see it there in verse 26. The verb is pleasant in one's eyes. It comes from the garden. The woman looking at the fruit and it was pleasing in her eyes. So it is a verb of perception. This information is given or this revelation comes to me and I process it. That's really the idea of the verb. I'm processing it in my mind. So the word comes to Saul that this daughter of yours is in love with David, and he's processing it. Now, here's the way you want to read narrative. Don't just skip over that. Why doesn't he explode? Why doesn't he go into a rage? Why doesn't he say something like, I just got rid of this guy with my first daughter, and now you're telling me my second daughter's in love with him. But he doesn't do that. That catches our attention. Verse 21, now we're inside the frame and we're going to the content that the writer has particularly spelled out that he wants us to come away from this text with. And Saul thought or said, now we're back into his mind and into his motives. Do you see the wheels turning and cranking in his mind? The second daughter's love can work for me too. Again, as we pointed out last time, this guy's just like Laban who had two daughters. Those daughters were nothing more than props. Props for their father to achieve his end. And that was for Jacob's labor for 14 years. Here, this second daughter is going to become a snare. A trap. Like one catches an animal. This is what I'm going to use to catch David. And for a second time, we have a new outlook here. Become my son-in-law this time. Why? Because he gets a second bite at the apple. Now we know 
why it was pleasing in his own eyes. Verse 22, and here is the manipulation with the full force of the government behind him, commanded. So now we're under royal orders. The plot is hatched. Remember back in verse 17, we talked about the image of the two hands, the providential hands. And they were a part of the plot of Saul. I'm not going to pull the trigger myself and kill him. I'll let the Philistines do that. Saul's hands are going to remain clean. His fingerprints are going to be nowhere to be found. No, he's going to let the Philistines do that for him. And so the heart that conceives wickedness will ultimately in time and place show expression. And here it is. I like to put right up next to this text, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. You're familiar with the text, for the Word of God is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So here are the thoughts and the intentions of the heart of Saul. Here they come. Speak to David. Secretly. Secretly. You know where that word comes from? Judges chapter 4 and verse 21. It's used of a virtuous woman by the name of Jael. Just like a penitentiary cell. And she is going to quietly sneak up on a enemy of Israel, a general by the name of Sisera, and put a tent peg right through his head. That's this word. Here's the content of Saul's thought. The king delights and the people love you. Now, don't miss, dismiss those words delight and love because they're found in another place in the scriptures and matter of fact it is an important point of biblical doctrine from the old testament it's called retributive justice what you do to someone will be done back to you you throw the boomerang and it has a way that God in providence will come back and hit you in the head. That's where the context of our Psalm 109, beginning in verse 17, using these very words occur. Since he loved, that's our word, cursing. Then may it come to him. Since he had no delight, there's our word, love and delight in blessing, may it be far from him. Since he clothed himself with cursing, may it come as his raiment, like water into his body, like oil into his bones, may it be like a garment he wears, a belt around him in this is a reward from the Lord. To my adversaries and those who speak evil against me. Be careful with your words, Saul. Because those words Holy Scripture says are going to bring a curse upon you. Speak to David. Now, David's response is wonderful. Because it flies right over his head. He doesn't take him to heart. He, he doesn't let words like that 
have any sunlight to grow or water in order to flourish. No. David's thoughts are upon how he's going to actually earn his way into this family. Does it seem to be a little thing to become the king's son-in-law? I mean, he's just a poor shepherd boy. How could he ever put together a bride price for the king's daughter? Verse 24, Saul now anticipating David's response, he's going to set the snare. And here it is. Verse 25, the king has no delight in a bride price except to be paid with a hundred foreskins of the Philistines in order to avenge himself on the king's enemies. The king's intention is clear. Now, it's one thing to get a lucky shot off at a big old lumbering giant, but it's another thing altogether to kill 100 combatants. That's the thought. The great Bruce Walke called it a suicidal mission. The term bride price comes from Genesis chapter 34 and verse 12. It's the money paid to the father of the woman. The payer intends to marry. It's usually money or the equivalent. The father in the ancient Near Eastern custom, he sets the price. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to have that custom today? Why, well, I'd have that boy still working for me after eight years, believe me. Here's Saul. He sets the money or the gift aside. How gracious. 100 foreskins of the Philistine fighters. Wow. Now that offer, now we call that sweat equity. You earn your way in. And it would appear that Saul has been so gracious to find a way for a poor shepherd to enter the family. An honorable doorway for all of Israel that covers the important feature of the protection of the nation. 100 dead Philistines. And that's giving great honor to his daughter, is it not? Yes. And so here we recognize that Philistines were not circumcised, so it's a proof of the kill. In the ancient Near East, you have all these grisly scenes of People lapping off heads and hands. They count them as kills. Here's the number that died in the battle. Here and there. Now we come to the important feature of our window. What our writer wants us to know that he's framed up for us. That we will not miss in the text. Look, it's the contractual agreement between Saul and David. 100 dead Philistine fighters, their foreskins, a proof of the death. Now that's certainly a grisly trophy to be sure, but the obligation between David and Saul is what the writer intended to do in framing the text. This is what he doesn't want you to forget and to remember. This is a historic fact. This legitimizes David's right into the royal family and thus the royalty of the kingship. Now that surprised me. It really surprised me. And I had to think about that. Because if you would have asked me at any time, well, why should David be the king of Israel? I would have said because he had the heart of, after the Lord. And he was the Lord's chosen. But nobody saw that. Nobody knew that. 
Nobody looked into his heart to see that. And well, then I would say, well, he was, he was anointed by Samuel the prophet himself. But nobody saw that. Remember, that was done right in front of the family. And done rather quickly. No. No, this, this means David deserves to be king because he earned it. He worked his way in. Matter of fact, it astonished me to find in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 14 that David references this bride price himself years later. It's a matter of record. 2 Samuel 3.14 that he paid 104 skins to marry Michael and thus to be made a royal. Now there's a very good practical application for all of us. Don't be cavalier about your agreements nor your obligations. Put them in writing so that there is a legal accountability regarding everything that you do. If a party won't sign a letter or an agreement, then you stay away from that party because they're not sincere in their offer or obligation at all. Now, look at this. So David, verse 27, arose and went forth with his men, but instead of a hundred, he killed two hundred. Think about that. He killed two hundred combatants on his own. This man is a killing machine. He is a warrior without an equal anywhere. And David brought the full number to the king. That term, verse 27, fulfilled, it implies that they were counted out in his presence. Paid and delivered in full, we would say. Thus, Saul has been checkmated. And he gave David Michael. But hey, come on. We know the guy we're dealing with here. He's not a giver. He's a taker. So later, he's going to take Michael away from David. And she'll be presented to Palti. 1 Samuel 25, 44. As Nikolai Lenin said, another useful idiot for history. There's no future with this man. There's no future here. Stay clear of him. He's cut off. He's cut away. He's cursed. <clears throat> Saul retrades the deal in time. But look, if Saul thought a hundred dead Philistines was a trap to kill David, look how wrong he was. Two hundred all counted out in his presence, and David's alive, and his reputation with the people has increased everywhere, and now he's your son-in-law. Hey, come on, let's all stand here for the camera. <laughs> Smile. What a great day this is for you, Saul. Verse 28, here is our Here's our second point of great theology. This one surprised me. And Saul knew that the Lord was with David. Now, look back at verse 12. It says on the text that Saul feared David because of God's blessing. That's the narrator telling us the story. This is different. This is quite different. 
This is Saul now knowing that across the table from me is the Lord. You know who else knew that in the Old Testament? The Egyptian charioteers. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 25. When they were chasing Israel across that Red Sea on the dry ground, and they were gaining on them, and they were going to get them right out there in the middle of the sea in that dry ground, except the wheels of their chariots began to wobble and fall off. And they began to go in this direction and that direction. And Exodus chapter 14, verse 25, the text says, that's when they knew. That's it. This is an impossible deal. That's the last thought they had. Here's the relevance to Saul knowing. Don't miss it. It's from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known, it was known by Saul about God. It's plain to them. God's made it plain. It's not a hundred foreskins, it's two hundred. Wherever this guy goes, he succeeds. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature has been clearly seen. He saw it. He understood it from what God had made. And thus Saul is without excuse. For although they knew God, Saul would tell you, I know God. Oh, I know God. But Paul says they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. Their thinking becomes futile and their foolish hearts are darkened. My friends, this is the verse that Saul is now signed, sealed, and delivered. The die is cast, and he is now condemned. The knowledge of God has foiled him. Look at the result, verse 29. The fear really begins to take hold, and it should. Afraid even more. See, became. He's transitioning. It's repeated twice. Paranoia now takes full force. David is Saul's enemy continually. In 2 Samuel 22, you have the Song of David, which is actually Psalm 18. And you have in Psalm, in 2 Samuel 22, 41, you have this line, you have made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me. And the parallel there in 2 Samuel twenty two forty one is that to be an enemy is to hate. That's what Saul did. Now, every day he gets up and he thinks about David. He abhors him. He despises him. He's his enemy. And now Saul is in contradiction to everyone. And the cancer of hatred is eating away at the man from this point forward. If you take two words to describe what's going on here with David in 1 Samuel chapter 18, you get two responses. One, he is an enormous success. The second is he brings fear, intimidation. In Genesis chapter 26, 
We have the story of Isaac, the son of the promise, the son of Abraham. He comes to a place called Gerar, and the king of Gerar treats him with hostility. He wants him out of there. And so Isaac leaves. And as he leaves, we're told he plants a crop and he reaps a hundredfold. Now, everybody likes to be around success. We all like to be with a winner. That's why we buy jerseys with the name on the back and the number. We want to be with winners. And everybody drives annually in May to Omaha to listen to Warren Buffett because we like success and we like to be with winners. And so, here is David, here is Isaac succeeding. And the constituents of Gerar, they steal his wells. His water wells that plant his crops and feed his livestock. So what does he do? Does he sue them? Does he take a stand? No, he is the meek man that inherits the earth. He just moves away. He drills another well and he finds water. And now the text says that all these Bedouins from all over the land of promise, they come and join Isaac. And now he is becoming like the Metroplex. Only the Metroplex moves around the territory. It doesn't stay in a location. And they come and steal his wells again. And what does he do? Does he take a stand? John Wayne would. But not Isaac. The meek man that inherits the earth moves out and drills another well and finds water. Before the end of that chapter, something rather startling happens. He gets a knock on his tent door. And surprise, surprise, it's the king of Gerar with all of his royal officials. And here's the opening words of Isaac. Why have you come to me since you have spoken so hostily toward me? And here's his response. We see that the Lord is with you in everything you do. Now, my friends, the people in the world will never understand your faith, but they will see the results of your faith. I was sitting across from a guy Thursday morning. Three years ago, he had just gotten out of Leavenworth. This guy was a big sports star. He was the president of a bank, and he was sentenced to five years in the Kansas Penitentiary. When I started meeting with him, he was a man of faith. He had gone in as a non-Christian. He came out as a Christian. But he was like a whip dog. He didn't want to look you in the eye. His face was down. He talked about how humiliated, how broken he was. And that that was the whole point that permeated our conversation. And I looked at him just Thursday, and I said, you're not even the man that I met with three years ago. Look at you. Your head's up. Hi. You've just told me that the most important thing of your life is going to prison. That the greatest fault and failure that you went through is the greatest thing that's happened to you. I said, you are a man talking about the future now. That is both intimidating and rather beautiful. It is intimidating to the world because you speak the truth of Christ. And 
It is attractive because you are so powerful in your testimony. We have a summary here, verse 30. It's a summary of a rather remarkable individual, David the victor, David against any and all. You either throw your lot in with him now, or you'll be left to face him as your enemy. The man who declared himself to be a nobody and lightly esteemed in verse 23 is now known and valued by everyone. David, more successful, the word studs the entire chapter. You see it in verse 5. You see it in verse 14. You see it in verse 15. You see it in verse 30. This young shepherd, chosen before the foundation of the world, he is on his way. And so are you who embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior and say, I take the greatest failures of my life and Christ builds a platform on them and I'm the new man or the new woman. My friends, we finish the chapter and here's my exhortation from what we've studied. You trust God. You trust Him with all your heart. You follow after His Word. You seek Him like you've never sought Him before. Because you see, He has a future all laid out and designed for you that you had no idea would take place. And it's a good one. It's a great one. And the promises for the future are yours. Are yours. Because he who is with you is far greater than he who is with them. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for your eternal word that sets our heart ablaze to live for you with all the passion and zeal that you would put in us in the days forward. For Christ's sake, amen.